want to acknowledge uh, all our sponsors and how awesome they have been. I can't, I cannot believe like for Irwin and uh, Verizon and Salesforce and Microsoft and John Cho, uh, Scott Cito and Bob of uh, Salesforce and John, Dan, Daniel from uh, Google and more and more, um, had Chris, Christine from Transform Hawaii government have been so kind and working with me and supportive and coming up with all these great classes that they've been teaching and John Cho coming up with the mentorship. I just, I really wanna say again, we can't do this without those people. And so, and, and I honestly, they're offering so many cool things now that you guys can use as students or as even as adults to expand your work uh, work uh, ex expertise, please take advantage of these tools that they're offering most of the time for free. Uh, I know there are some costs and certifications and so forth, but um, I heard from Salesforce that uh, there's many of very high paying jobs going wanting. So uh, keep an eye on all this, go listen to the workshops we've had. I, I can't emphasize enough how valuable and how much we appreciate here at Hack. I couldn't, I couldn't help run this event without their support. And thank you. And now Leo, I'll let you do the fancy introduction. Sorry. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, so welcome back from the break. Uh, I hope everybody had a good one. Um, so coming back from break up first, uh, we'll have Erin Sionko of Verizon talking about how creating connections will shape the future. Uh, so Without further ado, here's Erwin. Awesome, thank you, Leo. All right, just another quick audio check. Wanna make sure you guys can hear me. Good to there. go, okay, awesome, perfect. So thank you everybody, excited to be here with all of you. As Leo had mentioned, my name is Erwin Sianko, and so uh, I lead the teams in the state of Hawaii as well as the state of Alaska for all things Verizon. And so, uh, as you can see on the slide here, we're. Uh, you know, a connection company is what people most uh, mostly think of us as in providing connectivity. Uh, and I spoke earlier in the opening about this next industrial revolution that we were a part of. And so uh, what I wanted to do today is just take some time, share some insights, uh, as well as just, you know, kind of share some things that we're really proud about uh, as a company in creating and providing connectivity. And again, giving you a little more insight beyond just, again, that connectivity that lets people like share their TikTok videos and, you know, post their IG reels, right? So, uh, no, don't get me wrong. That stuff's all very important. But again, the stuff that I'm going to share today, I believe is pretty exciting. And it's potentially things that you uh, may end up crossing paths with in the future, uh, or even maybe with some of the work that you guys are doing today. So uh, if we go to the next slide here, so there's three specific elements that I'm gonna talk to you guys about today. So uh, again, connecting people and things is very important to us. So one of the things that I'll spend some time talking about is our Verizon Innovative Learning Program. Uh, something again, that's really exciting where we get a chance to support teachers and students throughout the country uh, and specifically targeting STEM, which I know all of you on this call are very familiar with. And so again, uh, taking that surgical approach to really support our communities and that very important uh, skill set and capability that comes with STEM that leads to future innovation for our communities and for our country, right? Uh, the other thing that I'll talk about is Verizon 5G Labs. So this is another great program and resource that's available to everyone. Uh, and this program is designed to really help accelerate innovation in not just specific industries, we're talking about industries across the board. Uh, and again, I'll give you a little more insight into that. There may be an opportunity for some of you to take advantage of this in the future uh, as those uh, programs uh, pulse throughout the year. Uh, and then the last thing I'll talk about is of course our network. That is something that we obviously are very proud of. Uh, and the reliability that it provides. And so what I'll do differently though, is I'll give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain on how we provide that connectivity to our communities. Uh, and then really focusing specifically on, you know, you think about the reliance that exists today for people and their tools, their systems and networks. Uh, so what I'll really, again, kind of double click into is uh, how we maintain that reliability that people can count on. And then also, again, give you a little bit of insight uh, as how we maintain that even during uh, challenging situations where infrastructure may be impacted, especially knowing here in Hawaii that we're in an isolated environment and that connectivity is critical 
uh, in all things that we do and keeping the uh, island connected and running. So uh, with that, I'll jump into the uh, Verizon Innovative Learning. So as you can see on the screen there, again, there's an opportunity here where we have to start with the children, right? So when you think about uh, what this program uh, entails, over 553,000 students have already been impacted by this program, uh, 30,000 teachers and 561 schools. Uh, and what this program really does is it allows us to utilize our resources, our knowledge, to provide access to technology to millions of students. And so when you think about, uh, again, you know, in some parts of the country, students may not have access uh, to some of the tools as, such as iPads and then connectivity from an internet perspective. Uh, and again, what we try to do is make sure we can provide those uh, opportunities and those resources to the schools that need them. So cool thing here is the schools can apply. So uh, again, any community has the opportunity to, you know, to go after this, these resources with us. Uh, they just need to go to the website and, uh, you know, fill out an application and there's some additional information that uh, we look for. But again, great program. And not only is it that we provide hardware uh, and connectivity for the students, but we also provide additional training and additional resources for the teachers as well. So again, it's a full suite uh, of resources that again, we start with the students with hardware and connectivity, but then also curriculum resources and accesses, access for the teachers as well. Uh, and again, that training is uh, amazing. So uh, excited to share again that we have that program available. Uh, I will say locally in the state of Hawaii, we've actually had two uh, schools that we've partnered with and that have been part of the program in the past. Uh, so again, you can see on the screen there, uh, that we've had in 2015, we partnered with a uh, school in Maui. So the first school is uh, Lokealani and then Kalama Intermediate. And so you can see, again, we were able to provide, uh, you know, tablets, you know, four years of connectivity. Uh, and then again, you know, making sure that those that don't have access at home to home internet, uh, those students will still be able to be connected. And then in 2016, uh, for Lokelani, we were so excited because we were able to help sponsor and send uh, those children to the VEX Robotics Competition, uh, where they got to represent Hawaii in their schools. And so you'll see a little bit of it, a little bit of it playing there as I'm speaking uh, on the screen. But again, we were really, really proud to be part of that and allow those children that opportunity uh, to participate in that program. So uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll let some of this video play without me talking, and you guys can get a little insight as to how that went. teams from around the world has been more of an eye-opener for my students and being a part of something greater. In our countries, Sambusa. We're preparing for our very first showing here at Next World. Our team is a team that's been seven years in the making and struggled through ups, downs, family things, and it's been thousands of hours of work and they're here just to realize that nothing is impossible. Adrenaline pumping. Yep, I'm scared. Scared. Faith and believe. Faith and believe. And have fun, enjoy, and let's do this. Okay, drivers, here we go. It's time to begin in three, two, one, go. Bring it forward, yeah. Okay, back. Yeah, back. I think this experience is gonna make me a better engineer because I see different ideas from other teams so then I can build something in the future that will help the world. <laughs> All right, pretty amazing, right? So in addition to that, 
Uh, again, we were able to support uh, the opportunity for other schools in the future. So if anybody is uh, still in school or maybe has a sibling in school, just know that that program is available on our websites to apply. Uh, so the next thing that you see on the screen here is Verizon 5G Labs. Again, another resource that we provide where Again, if you if you read the, the information on the slide there, so lab challenges, hackathons similar to this. So we sponsor our own uh, academic programs uh, really focused around the power of 5G. And so as you can see on the screen there, there is a solution playing. Uh, that was actually one of the challenge winners from one of our programs that we had uh, in a previous year where basically they created a uh, application that utilizes our 5G network uh, AR graphics and allowed the user to kind of partner with, as you can see on the screen, the ability to interact real time live uh, with some work that we were, they were doing on a vehicle and live with another person on the other end, they were able to, again, using AR overlay information and send that information back and forth during the conversation to allow a solution and a repair to happen. Uh, on that particular uh, problem that they were solving for. So again, some pretty amazing stuff. I mean, low latency is obviously needed for that. Uh, and that's what the 5G network provides. But again, you can see beyond what was on the screen, this program is readily available, as I mentioned, uh, for people to participate. And even if there's not a challenge at the moment that is providing a grant, there's still opportunities uh, to attend roundtables, listen to experts, on a panel and just you know technology showcases uh, that are being provided. And again, that information is readily accessible on our website uh, under Verizon 5G Lab. So again, another great resource for our community uh, to again, allow folks to have resources to continue to move uh, you know, technology forward uh, in everything that we do. So now the next uh, slide that I'm gonna show you here does have another video in it. I'm gonna pause this one so it doesn't start right off the bat. So actually, okay, it's already paused for me. Uh, but so this was one of the ways that locally, again, here we partnered in the state of Hawaii. So we partnered with HECO uh, with a solution. And so I think many of you probably are aware that we do have a goal uh, in the state of Hawaii to be 100% you know, renewable energy uh, reliant in by 2045. And so again, uh, I'll play the commercial here. You guys might've seen it a few years ago, but again, it showcases uh, what we provide from a technology standpoint and how we can partner with uh, businesses, organizations, you know, companies in Hawaii uh, to, again, continue to eliminate that digital divide and, and make, you know, things more efficient and better in the state of Hawaii. So. Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We're the most isolated population on the planet. Hawaii is the first state in the U.S. to have 100% renewable energy goal. We're a very small electric utility, but if we don't make this move, we're gonna have changes in our environment and have a negative impact to Hawaii's economy. Verizon provided us a solution using smart sensors on their network that lets us collect near real-time data on our power grid. This technology is helping us integrate rooftop solar, which is a very important element of getting us to our renewable energy goals. If we can create our own energy, we can take care of this beautiful place that I grew up in. Awesome, so thank you. Hopefully again, you guys have seen that commercial in the past. Again, one of the partnerships that we were very proud of uh, you know, in the state of Hawaii specifically. So uh, next item here. So now I talked earlier about giving you a little peek uh, behind the curtain around our network. And so, uh, you know, you can see there uh, in the state of Hawaii, we actually have uh, a switching center. And, you know, for us, again, that reliability of the network is critical. And so what I'm showing you there uh, is some insight into the redundancy. So anybody obviously with an engineering background understands how important that is uh, from a connectivity standpoint. And so just to give you some insights, uh, you can see like cooling is obviously very important, right? Power and space, kind of the main three currencies of any data center or switching facility. And when you look at what we provide here in the state of Hawaii to ensure that the connectivity again stays where it needs to be. Uh, if you think about the cooling component, so HVAC, so our system, uh, has redundancies built in and N plus two uh, essentially means that like with our chillers, for example, there's, you know, the chiller itself, 
the additional chiller, which would be kind of the plus one in redundancy, right? The first backup. And then we have another one beyond that. So again, if you think about uh, the amount of effort that we put in the resources we dedicate to ensure that connectivity is where it needs to be, that's an example of that. You know, there's, again, the N plus three means that we have our normal pump. And beyond that, there's, you know, two additional pumps, uh, or I should say three additional pumps to uh, make sure that we have any failures with any hardware or any of that equipment that again there's a an opportunity to make sure that that connection stays there and then you know the n plus one is so you think about uh, how important air conditioning is in hawaii so the air handling units is what hau ahu stands for uh, again we have an extra in every room in every environment where that cooling is so critical uh, to ensure that equipment is is functional and operational and just to also give you this insight so the building that our uh, switching center is located in uh, can survive hurricane force five uh, conditions. Uh, and so it's potentially one of the safest you, places you can be uh, during a hurricane, right? So again, just some insights, wanted you guys to have a little bit of understanding of what we do and how we ensure that that connectivity stays, uh, even in times of, again, risk or challenge, depending on our environment. And then one additional slide, and this is again, peek behind the curtain. So, uh, yeah, obviously, again, when things happen and equipment starts to go down or equipment gets damaged, uh, we have what's called the barnyard uh, at our switch, uh, and it houses multiple vehicles that serve a very specific purpose in ensuring that, again, the network can stay up. So the first animal is a cow. So that's cell on wheels. And what that is basically is a cell site that's uh, on a set of wheels that can be trailered. Uh, you know, to an area that, you know, needs that connectivity and needs that additional, uh, you know, uh, network element. You've got a sat cult, which is basically a satellite cell on light truck. Uh, so again, in a, in a situation where maybe we lose a tower or something gets damaged, uh, and then even maybe there's a fiber cut. So we lose the backhaul that allows that con connectivity for that cell site. We roll one of these things out there. It uses satellite connectivity, and then we can light up that area again with coverage and connection. Uh, and especially in situations where there's emergency services, uh, maybe setting up a base and a camp. I mean, obviously these things are very, uh, very useful and very helpful to have. And these resources, again, are all here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and again, they're ready to deploy at a moment's notice, moment's notice if there's an issue or a concern uh, in, our, in our community. So mm -hmm. now the goats, uh, so that's not Michael Jordan. So right, the goats are generators on a trailer. Uh, so again, you know, power is one of those elements that are needed. And some of you may remember, it was, uh, I want to say it was December of last year, where we had uh, a couple of issues with uh, power or power outages. And so when we have cell sites that are, you know, built on top of buildings or high rises, for example, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to install generators on tops of those buildings because of the limited space. But again, if a situation were to happen, like we saw in uh, December of 2021, we were able to roll out those uh, generators on a trailer, plug them in to the cell sites and get those cell sites back online, even though there wasn't any power uh, in the environment. So, and then the last one I'll talk about is a steer. So that's a satellite backhaul trailer. So again, in a situation where we have a fiber cut, and so there's no data flowing through those cell sites, uh, we can bring this trailer in that, that does have a satellite uh, link attached to it that again will get us connected back and light those sites back up again for use uh, for our community. So again, not sure if many people know that we have a barnyard or farms uh, in each of the places that we have these switches to again pro you know, provide connectivity for our communities. Uh, but so now you can say that you know uh, that Verizon does have again a barnyard in Hawaii with cows, goats, steers, and, uh, and sat colts. So, Again, to everybody, thank you for your time. Excited to be able to share this with you. And I know that we have a little bit of time for Q&A. So I'll, uh, I'll stop here. And Thelma, I don't know if you'll help me moderate or if I need to pull up the chat. Uh, I have uh, the barnyard is pretty cool. Jordan is indeed the goat is one, the one comment we've had. Uh, but if anybody has questions now that he's done talking, you can turn on your, your uh, camera or your microphone and ask directly. Um, and, uh, or just put your questions in chat and I will make sure Erwin answers them for you. Any other comments, questions, concerns?
I thought that was pretty cool too. I didn't know they had animal names for all those backup things. And uh, if, if you're on the Verizon backbone and uh, you don't need to, it sounds like they've got it under control to make sure that the, do, do you do that in other other states like, you know, California earthquakes? Uh, do you have uh, the same kind of redundancies and, and backups for other locations? We do, Thelma. Yeah, it's throughout the country. And so, I mean, obviously there is, you know, and uh, our hearts go out to, uh, you know, the folks that live in uh, Florida, you know, oh, that yeah. were affected by the recent hurricane. And so, yeah, we, uh, because of the strength of that hurricane, we actually had to deploy many of these uh, assets uh, to ensure that there was con connectivity for the folks that were in those affected areas. So, uh, again, it's one of the things we take much pride in, in, in making sure. And I know for this group, from a, again, from a coding and from a, you know, the things that you guys are looking to create, uh, again, at some point or another, connectivity is going to be important, right? Like the, the platform, the vehicle that's going to allow these, uh, you know, tools and resources to be able to be utilized by the end users or, again, uh, ensuring that, you know, there's, you know, the ability for those things to, to work when they need to, to, no matter what's going on in the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're excited to provide that, so. Great. So uh, what, what's the lessons we can take in regards to the hack solutions? Do you got any, did you, if you, I know you were here during the challenges, uh, do you any, have any uh, perspective? Cause obviously one of the, most of the challenges are about dealing with data and uh, getting it into the right hands in the right format. Uh, and even, even the, the URL shortener is that kind of thing is because we want the URL shortener so we can get data in people's hands. Um, and I know that Verizon and other cell networks are uh, very data rich. So do you see anything that you feel Verizon can do to help um, get the data from the right people to the right people? Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, you hit the nail on the head for us, like where, where our value would come in, uh, in with those solutions is obviously that data needs to be accessible and it needs to be uh, organized in a way and, and, and again, accessible uh, to allow it to have its maximum impact. And obviously when you're dealing with lots of data as well, like the ability to move that data uh, safely and reliably uh, you think about, you know, data breaches and things of that nature. And so, uh, again, you know, we, we obviously in our networks, because they're wireless are, you know, there's, there's lots of protocols that are built in to ensure uh, the safety and the transmission of that information. So I think, yeah, from a, again, getting access and making it easy for people uh, to have it in the field, for example, as well, not just in offices, offices is important because we know now that remote work is becoming a bigger, bigger part. Uh, of what we all do on a daily basis. And especially with things where you're trying to gather and collect data when you're out in the field uh, for some of those solutions that it looks like that you guys will be building for, so. Perfect. That seems to be our questions, uh, unless anybody else has got anything else. Again, Erwin, um, greatly appreciate you participating. I will have you all know, you should be very nice to Erwin. He's going to be one of our judges on November 5th. <laughs> so he makes note of who asked him questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, Erwin will be one of our judges uh, on our judging panel on um, November 5th. And so you'll be seeing his, his face again. Uh, several times probably. And again, I can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate your supporting this program for us. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys. Uh, excited to see what you guys come up with. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you, Arwen, for that presentation and for being one of our terabyte sponsors for this year's event. Uh, up next, we will be hearing from Joe uh, Kumabe of Unisys on why taking time to gather requirements helps you to, de to deliver a better solution. Uh, floor is yours, Joe. Uh, before Joel, before you get started, I do want to ask, do you prefer people to ask, interrupt and ask you questions as they're going along, or do you want them to put it in chat? And then um, how, how would you like to handle questions if there are any? 
Oh, interactive is fine. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if anybody uh, heard that exchange or paying attention. Uh, Joel was happy for you to turn on your camera and ask him a question, or if you're shy and don't want to do that, please put your questions in the uh, chat uh, channel and uh, I or Sheila will interrupt him for you and ask him the questions. Now this, qu this um, uh, um, workshop would normally have been held uh, the first uh, interim workshop uh, weekend. Uh, the reason we're doing it here is because again, the same reason where we did all those pre-event workshops is because we wanted to make sure you have everything in your, you all the tool sets you need to um, uh, put together your uh, solution, uh, solutions properly. So uh, I will tell you, Joel, you're sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> I was going to ask You're the that. screen with the uh, <laughs> notes and the next slide as opposed to. Uh, that always happens. I do that myself all the time. Um, it, it's probably, if you're using PowerPoint, you need to go into PowerPoint and tell them which slide you want to default to is usually where this comes in. Okay, hang on a second. And you have time, so don't feel rushed. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how to do this because I haven't used Zoom for a while. Okay. Uh, it, I, I would uh, stop sharing your screen. It would be the best thing to do. Go to your PowerPoint presentation and on the uh, slideshow tab, there's a little box that says which screen it's going to default to. Oh, meaning meaning your big presentation. Do you have more than one screen? Yeah, that's right. That's the problem. Yep, it's the problem. It's the one thing that always catches me. Yeah, got it. And uh, feel free to ask questions as we get started here. This is really an important uh, uh, topic. Uh, this is particularly uh, keep in mind. This will help that's you. That's perfect. For your afternoon questions, with uh, keep keep his suggestions and recommendations in mind, tips and tips and tricks. Uh, he's done this type of work a lot for Unisys, so listen in. Okay, are you ready to go? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Sounds, sounds good. Great. Let me stop my video as well. Okay. Hey, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, present this uh, requirements gathering. Uh, with you folks. Um, you know, it, <laughs> following Irwin's a little tough. I mean, I don't have the videos and, and the, the farm and everything, but uh, this is something that's uh, very important, especially as you start embarking on your projects. Uh, I'm not going to talk about myself. Uh, I've been at this for quite a few years and I've worked in a number of companies, but um, that's not really important at this point. Uh, what is important <clears throat> is that there's a software development life cycle <clears throat> that um, is generally accepted as, as how we develop systems. And the first thing that uh, you really need to do is, is gather requirements. And the, the reason for that, we'll go into a little bit later, but the life cycle has you gather requirements, then you do the design, then you develop the system, you test it, you put it into, into practice, you implement it. And then once you put it into practice, um, there's always some maintenance or enhancements that occur because maybe you miss something or, or the environment changes or your business changes. And then you go and require, gather requirements again and you go through the entire cycle once more. You know, requirements gathering really is something that, oh, second, one second meant to help you understand really why you're doing what you're doing and designing a system that meets the needs of the user that's requesting it and the business that's uh, involved with it. It's a process of really determining what the project is about, how you achieve it, and what needs to be created to actually put it into practice like we saw in the life cycle. So you're probably familiar with the fact that, um, you know, everyone has their own assumptions about what a project is. And we're kind of going into that a little further. Um, but requirements are a stated fact about what you're trying to build and are specific to what's being developed. And you're pretty much describing how the system should behave 
any of the properties or attributes of that system, including anything that restricts what that system should or shouldn't do. Now, requirements gathering is not development. It's really gathering what the, the, what the system really needs from a more from a business and functionality standpoint. So you probably have seen this diagram a number of times. It, it really is kind of sort of a joke, but you know, the unfortunate part is it's pretty much reality. Um, if you look on the left, it says how the customer explained it. And, and we'll kind of touch on a lot of that uh, as we go forward. Um, as you look at the second, second uh, picture, how the project leader understood it is also really important because have, not having specific um, requirements will lead to misunderstanding about the project. Um, as it goes further down the line, you can kind of see how all of a sudden everyone has a different interpretation of what this thing is supposed to do. And the funny thing is at the end of the day on the right, is what the customer really, really wanted. But if you look at the last picture and you look at the first picture, they're not the same. So it's very important for us as we start gathering requirements and having discussions to make sure that we do, we ask the right questions and we probe and discuss. And a lot of times we document what's being done so to make sure that we don't end up with false expectations or the systems that are not designed correctly. So why are you really gathering requirements? Why are we do, doing this in the first place? The reason why we're doing it is through, through uh, everyone's experience and through history, increased customer and client satisfaction is always the key. And you want to document the systems and make sure that everyone's on board with what is being uh, delivered, or I'm sorry, designed, and the requirements are matching because you don't want that missed expectations. Like that first first picture and the last picture where there's three three uh, seats and they actually really wanted a tire on a, on a rope. Also, because design, the, the, I'm sorry, because requirements will lead to the design and development, you wanna make sure that you have fewer delays because there's less problems along the path. You also have increased co consistency and reuse. So a lot of times in, in, in business and in, in development, um, there's a lot of reuse. And, and you notice that, especially when, when it comes to um, having, having a lot of open source uh, coding, for example, where, you know, you can, you can pretty much go on the inter internet and for certain um, types of, of uh, development tools, you can go into a, a public area and grab software solutions or coding, coding solutions that you can just plug into your, your project. Um, also, there's a uh, reduced need to rework things because if you get it right the first time, you don't have to rework it, right? Um, and time is money. So any time that you can reduce the amount of effort that you have, you always reduce cost. Uh, increasing trust is always something that you wanna make maintain because if you design something or you have the requirements set correctly and you build it correctly, then you increase trust. Uh, you also provide better communications because you're talking about it. You should have fewer de defects. And the most important, and this happens to almost all projects, is something called scope creep. And scope creep is, is um, pretty prevalent in, in almost all projects. And, and a lot of projects I know I've worked on where you know, we spend a lot of time trying to prevent scope creep. And that is that you design something with someone, you, you work through all the requirements. And during that whole life cycle of that development, people's wants versus needs start getting in, in the way. And, the difference between a need and a want really starts to impact what the overall project looks like. And the difference is that a need is something that is required, a want is something that's nice to have. And a lot of times people try to put in the nice to haves as a requirement and then the project gets larger and larger and gets more delayed. And, and a lot of times you miss your expectations and you have a, you know, a, a, a different product that was originally planned. <clears throat> 
So how do you go and get requirements? So there's a number of techniques that are they're out there. Um, you know, all of these can be done um, interchangeably. Uh, typically for most uh, projects, you work with interviews, you do questionnaires or surveys. If you want to do more standardization, questionnaires and surveys are really, really effective because um, you can send out the same question, but the unfortunate part is they won't tell you what they don't know. So um, there's less flexibility with questionnaires and surf, uh, surveys. Um, a lot of time you observe current operations to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, and then document some of that. Uh, you look at uh, documents that are currently produced, some, sometimes their workflows, their uh, process documents, et cetera. Uh, you look at interfaces that, that, that might be out there, different systems that connect to the, the one that you're working on. Um, you do workshops. Uh, uh, one of the most famous workshops is called JAD and JAR. Uh, it was uh, kind of very popular back in the day when IBM was uh, one of the, the biggest uh, companies doing a lot of the integration work. And uh, it's called joint application design and joint application requirements. So what would happen is you get a whole bunch of folks in the room and then you kind of walk through the process. And the reason for that is that um, a lot of times all of the information seems to be uh, trapped in one lead person's head. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not exactly what the workflow is uh, really happening. So having a workshop with everyone there, a lot of times you can kind of uh, get collaboration and it's kind of like brainstorming. You get all the information in from everyone, you put that together and then you get a consolidated uh, view of what is actually happening in the operation versus just one person's view of what they think they know. Um, brainstorming uh, is, is another one. Role playing is, is really good. Role playing kind of goes with, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the whole workshop thing because you kind of are playing the, you know, I'm the customer versus, you know, how the system is working, uh, or I'm sorry, how the customer work interacts with your, um, your staff or your company, and you can kind of document that. Uh, there's use cases and scenarios. We'll kind of cover use cases a little later. Uh, focus groups. Uh, focus groups are really good if you have um, customer-facing applications or you want uh, customers to um, engage and give you input into how your systems are uh, functioning. Uh, you roll out a new, you know, you plan to roll out a new website, you have a focus group and they'll tell you, oh, this sucks, or I like that part, I don't like this part. Um, and that kind of sort of goes along with prototyping as well. Prototyping has been very popular recently, especially if you wanted to roll out uh, applications very quickly, you prototype it, you release it, um, you get more input either from focus groups or from the public, the general uh, customer base, and then you start uh, improving it as you go along. So anyway, those are some of the requirements uh, techniques that you can use. <laughs> but some of the tips and uh, kind of uh, as you start trying to gather requirements, I kind of put the, the three on the right side as maybe the most important in my mind. Um, when you're doing requirements gathering, you have to really keep an open mind. You really don't have, you really should not try to have a preconceived idea about what they're going to tell you. Just keep an open mind. Be, be like a, a reporter or a journalist, you know, just listen and, and gather information. Uh, active listening is, you know, listening and asking questions, engaging a lot more. And when you're gathering information, try not to develop a solution. We, I, we all have a bad habit of trying to solve the problem while they're trying to describe it. But, um, you know, really try to gather the information because the whole purpose of, of requirements gathering really in, in some large, larger organizations or in more practice, you might not be the one developing the solution. Gathering requirements might be that you, as an analyst or, or as a project manager, you're gathering these, this information and you may pass it off to someone that, let's say they're in India or, or offshore. And um, one of the key things that you wanna do is make sure that your requirements are literally correct. Um, we had situations where we worked with people offshore that um, English is not their first language. So they take 
whatever you put on paper very very literally so make sure that that you view that and and make sure that your requirements are very literally correct uh don't use slangs don't use a, a lot of uh uh things that are not very clear um you know using using um using templates is always very very good um it helps to standardize things um teamwork is really really important um having a good strong team that works together also creates consistent communication among the team and also uh when later on we we'll talk about documentation but when you start to, starting to develop the documentation uh it's a little clearer and more consistent um don't just record requirements you know the fourth box is you're actually learning how and what the end user wants you're not, like I said, keep an open mind, but you're also trying to learn along the way. So you can actually be more of a value add than just taking in information. Uh, keep your clients in the loop. That's really important just to kind of make sure and maintain the fact that our requirements, um, a lot of times there's questions or, or things that need to be clarified. You want to make sure that there's uh, more consistency with uh, communication with the, the, whoever the client is. And the last one, uh, I'm not sure if 100% agree, but but I, I understand the concept of assuming that client knows nothing. Um, that also kind of, uh, you know, that attribute uh, should be uh, tied to you as well. Assume that you know nothing. So both, uh, you know, having both sides start from scratch uh, keeps keeps everything vanilla. Um, there's no assumptions along the way as you as you move forward with. Uh, trying to understand how to gather um, the, the, the foundation of the information that you're trying to, you know, uh, use for the design of the system. <clears throat> now, uh, I, I put this in because it's a little, um, I, I kind of had to have a little thought about this. And requirements gathering um, changes develop depending on the development method that you're using. And what the reason why I highlighted the waterfall in red is waterfall is probably one of the more traditional development methods that's been used for for decades, um, and we'll kind of cover that. The rest of them are, are a lot more iterative. So, um, but the more popular one really is agile. So we can, we'll come kind of focus on waterfall and agile and look at the differences and the differences in how you would gather requirements for for the two different methodologies. <clears throat> Now in waterfall, uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you notice, um, you get the first thing you do is gather requirements. You gather requirements for the whole system all at once. You go through and gather it and you document it and you go through these phases where you gather all the requirements from start to finish, then you go into the design session. Um, <clears throat> and that's pretty important because in waterfall, the structure of requirements is that you gather everything from start to finish. You can review the whole system from start to finish as far as the requirements are concerned so that there's a lot more consistency sometimes between the requirements because you are looking at the whole picture at one time. Now, um, it does take a lot longer, but you know, for most, um, large projects, especially government type projects, um, most projects are gonna be waterfall based because the requirements, the way the RFPs are written, uh, you would normally gather most of the requirements up front. Now that doesn't, that doesn't account for all projects, but a, a lot of uh, larger projects would have a similar structure. <clears throat> now there, there's good and bads of it. We're not gonna cover that, but you know, it's an older method and, and obviously, you know, um, it, it is slow and a little more costly, but it also creates more structure and tighter controls. And, and so that's, you know, one of the good things, especially when you're working on something like a contract. <clears throat> but, you know, one of the more popular views is that, you know, uh, development methods, uh, methodologies is agile, and it's pretty popular, especially with a lot of web development, a lot of um, dot com applications, where you know you're really creating a this iterative 
view where you take a, a project, you start breaking it down. And when you break it down, you, you start working on each piece at a time. And we'll kind of cover that. But <clears throat> uh, the good thing is that it, it allows software to be released in iteration. So you kind because of, you're breaking things down. Uh, into smaller bite-sized pieces and then developing those bite-sized pieces. The danger with that is you have to make sure that all the bite-sized pieces connect correctly and are working together you know, across the board. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it's kind of a, a, a different way of looking at it, but um, there's a, you know, pros and cons, uh, cons on both sides. Now, requirements fall into three basic categories. Uh, business requirements, user requirements, and system requirements. And now, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned before, the requirements have are, are there to tell you what the system is supposed to do, not to actually do the development. And there's also an inv inverse relationship on impact. If you don't get your business requirements done, it has a larger impact than if you miss a system requirement. So if you miss a, a business requirement, obviously, the, the scope of that's gonna, gonna be a lot larger and, and the impact's gonna be a lot larger as well. But in the business requirement, you're looking at from the business objectives, you're looking at scope, um, then you start um, decomposing that to the user's point of view and what they're looking at. And those, those user views need to tie into the business requirement. And once you get the user uh, requirements done, then you take the system requirements and they need to match up to the user requirements. So everything kind of cascades as you start decomposing it. Now, um, how do you start this project? Well, the first thing that you need to do is really start looking at the overall objective of the project. And project objectives can be things like, you know, revenue costs, you know, customer experience. There's a lot of uh, components that are involved with getting project objectives. But the idea is what the heck are you trying to do? What value are you trying to bring? What is the purpose of it? What is the direction? <clears throat> and so you're gonna ask a lot of questions. Uh, what are we doing? What is the scope of the project? Who sponsor, who are the end user, who makes decisions? Um, you know, th there's a lot of things that, that go into that question of who, what, why, all the things that you need to ask about what are you trying to accomplish. And so once you start doing that and you start asking those questions, you're going to kind of come to, uh, you know, a pretty much a, a, an understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so let's say our business objective is to do a cookie company, a uh, cookie, cookie website. Sorry. I love cookies. So um, <laughs> That's the first thing I thought about last year with cars because I like cars, but this year we do cookies. Um, and uh, so I took a cut at looking at some uh, cookie websites for online, online cookie orders. I found this one because I thought it looked pretty nice. And I also found this other one that looks pretty nice as well. And so I thought, okay, well, what would happen if we tried to address developing, uh, you know, a cookie online cookie website? Because you know, that's, that's what our business is. <clears throat> and so we look at the business requirements, the business requirements would say, what are, what's the need for the proposed project? What is, what's the need for this cookie ordering website? And why are we doing the project? And so, you know, you take that statement and then you come up with something like this and say the new cookie company website will serve our underserved cookie lovers and allow them to select and order cookies of the choice. And, you know, it's known as home and office. And you get to custom order your selections, receive fresh cookies, and that's, that's really what the business objective is. Now, <clears throat> once we have that in place, then now we look at the user requirements. So what is the system, what is this cookie website gonna do? And from the user point of view, and what are, what are some of the objectives of that? And so there's two, two sub requirements. And now, like I mentioned earlier, there are user requirements and system requirements. And the difference is that the user requirements are gonna state really written from the customer viewpoint and the system's gonna be a, a, basically a breakdown of that. 
So our user requirements are gonna say, well, what are they gonna be able to do with this website that we're building and the goals that we're trying to accomplish? And like we said, the user requirements are driven by the business requirements. So we have to make sure that they're tied together. So in this example, we said the customer would do create accounts, view whatever cookie flavors you have, order cookies, manage their orders, receive status of the orders, you know, doing all the things that you would normally do on a, on a cookie website. <clears throat> the system requirements are really broken down into detailed specifications of others and the breakdown of the user requirements. And it's going to be the foundation for designing the system because that's really where all the details are. And it says, you know, really when you look at it, it might be part of a system contract because you may actually um, use the requirements to develop a request for a proposal, which is normally uh, a document that states, hey, here's all the things that I want. Somebody please bid on this and develop it for me. And here's what I need. And then you'd list all the requirements in that request for proposal. And they will come back and then you would bid on it. And uh, hopefully all of your requirements are listed because it's gonna be uh, developed and designed based on whatever you put on paper. And we'll cover that a little bit later. So <clears throat> system requirements fall into two, two categories, functional and non-functional. And uh, the functional requirements are really are the breakdown of what the system is going to do functionally or how it's going to work. The non-functional requirements are all the other things that are associated with, with um, how and some of the restrictions that um, are going to be placed on, on, the, on whatever you're developing. So functional requirements is really what, the, what is the developer supposed to build in more detail. Uh, how they're going to do it. But again, it may re remember that it has to cascade downwards. So looking at the user requirements and business requirements, everything has to align. <clears throat> so functional requirements, you know, they, they can search the database, they can do all these detailed technical things that functionally will work. But you're not describing the detail of how it should work. It's what should work. So in this case, you know, we have, we're, we have an order, uh, you know, draft up and said, okay, if we're going to do shipping details, we need to search the database for the customer address. And that's assuming that, let's say that, um, you know, they have an account. And so they don't have to automate, they don't have to fill it in because we, don't, you know, by default, pull in their address from, you know, their profile would be a, you know, functional um, requirement. <clears throat> the non-functional requirements uh, can cover a gamut of things, including, you know, uh, efficiency, usability, things like uh, standards, even, even legal and safety, uh, other things like that. <clears throat> now, we co kind of covered gathering requirements, but the one thing that uh, is really important is, and people don't like to do this, is um, document the results. Um, but the requirements document is the official statement of what the system is going to do. Like I mentioned before, if you're going to do a request for a proposal or you're going ship to ship this off to a developer, um, it has to include all of the pieces. It's not a design document because there's going to be a design architect that will take a look at the requirements and start doing the, the system design itself. Uh, but it should say what the system's gonna do rather how to do it. And I'm gonna skip, sorry. <clears throat> but in the requirements document, you know, there's normally a project summary, there's objectives, there's uh, background information, drivers, all the things that we collected so far will be all included in that. Um, some of the things that uh, are not there that we mentioned, um, uh, so we didn't mention yet, were things like assumptions, constraint risk issues, things that, that might impact what your design looks like or your requirements look like and affect the design. Um, and then a lot of times you'd include a process flow of how it's 
currently being done and how it's going to be in the future. And that's to show that, hey, the system today is doing this, but we'd like it to do this. And this, these are the requirements of how it should look um, going forward. Then you start documenting all of the business requirements and you kind of list them. And if you notice that there's a lot of reference for use cases, now the use cases breakdown of how the system should work in an agile environment, you'd break it down into use cases. And so there's a reference point here where you would tie in. So in this particular case, you'd have a system and then you'd break it down into smaller, smaller chunks. And those smaller chunks will then be broken down into use cases that will describe each of the, the parts that, or how the system, how the, that component is gonna be used. And then you document that. Now, once you gather all of those, then, then you start getting to all the details. And, and I just put this here because, you know, the, the thing that everyone starts running to first are these details. like. What's the, do, you know, what's the domain name? What's the, what's, what kind of design are we gonna have? What, what kind of you know, color palette, what style guide, all these other things. But um, I put all these in here, but you know, we're not gonna cover it because this is really all the, the, really the, the design components that will come after what happens when you gather your requirements and turn it over to a, a solution architect or a designer to actually create all of these things that you see here, those field considerations, you know, things, stupid things that, that, you know, not stupid things, sorry, things that you don't, don't normally consider. Like if you get, grab the data from a mainframe, then it's EBCDEC versus if it's, you know, from mostly other solutions at ASCII and sort orders are different, you know, all those details come in, in the design part, which, you know, is a result of the requirements. So anyway, with that, um, any, I'm going to skip all of this to, um, any questions? <clears throat> I didn't see any. So I had a question on um, the, the the various methodologies. That yes. You had. And um, everybody's kind of used to doing agile, and the um, you know they like like you were indicating that the the more traditional contracts are still looking at waterfall because that's the more traditional way mm -hmm. um, how do you how can you uh integrate maybe the other two into the waterfall approach so that you kind of um uh, uh, marry an alliteration of, <laughs> of a solution as well as satisfy these more traditional uh organizations yeah, I have my opinion. I don't know if it's, it's going to work or not. Ah, but... Give your opinion. Let's <laughs> let's hear what it is. I, I have okay. mine, so and I won't <laughs> offer it here. So I'll let you be the, the expert here. So. Well, you know, having worked on, a, on, on a, being responsible for one of the projects that is doing that, um, the, the pro probably the most important thing is, is if you're going to um, try to integrate a hybrid solution, um, make sure you get all the requirements done first. Um, and make sure that, that the requirements are, are uh, well documented from end to end. Uh, and then you apply the agile approach to what you've gathered by breaking down those requirements into smaller pieces to go through the iterative cycle of agile. That's a um, when you're breaking down to epics and then, you know, you, you start to build up the use cases from that. Um, if you are not gathering the requirements from end to end, there's a pretty fair chance that, that as you start moving forward, because the system might be so large, that there might be gaps that form that you're gonna to have to catch at the end. As you in, do integration testing through the whole thing, you're gonna find out that, oh my gosh, I missed this part, or this piece doesn't fit into that piece. But if you do the requirements all up front, um, you might have a more successful opportunity at at accomplishing the entire system. Plus you can see the entire system design up front rather than, I'm sorry, the entire system workflow from start to finish as opposed to pieces at a time. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're working on a contract right now. Uh, one of the things that um, very important is that, that gathering those requirements up front 
um, does help in looking, helping the customer look at the entire system from start to finish and what they would like to do as far as operations and workflow in those requirements overall. Whereas if I think if you do it at Agile uh, for a large project, um, although development becomes easier, I think the requirements start getting a little bit lost in, in the process as well. Hope that yeah, answers I, your question. Yeah, I think Agile tends to apply better for like entrepreneurial startup situations. Yeah. Yeah. Myself it's, as well. I've seen, I, I, I do a lot of entrepreneurial mentoring everybody uh -huh. and they, that it's much more, e it's easier to be agile, particularly when you're taking small bites of the, yeah. the solution you're trying to develop. And that yeah. might apply here too, right? Because this is kind mm -hmm. of a little more agile. Um, a couple questions. Um, is a DevOps approach not recommended from Benjamin? Oh, no, no, no. I, I didn't pull DevOps. And the reason for that, well, let me hang on. Let me see if I can, I left all my, Supplementary slides here. Good so, for you. <laughs> <laughs> as backup, just in case these questions came up. Okay. No, DevOps is really popular, um, but you know, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time going through all the different methodologies. But you know, this whole um, design, build, code thing, as you start looping through, um, to me, there's there's two challenges with DevSecOps or DevOps. One we kind of mentioned before is that. Um, trying to look at the whole system and then try to decompose it um, is hard. Um, when you start breaking things down, you have to make sure that you haven't missed anything in the, in the process. Um, the other thing that I've noticed on DevSecOps is, which is kind of funny because for smaller organizations, they've always done, done DevOps because they only have like two, three people that have to do all the jobs. For bigger yeah. organizations that have segregated the jobs, then DevSecOps is kind of, or DevOps is kind of a, a, a newer function. But for smaller shops, they've been doing this for, for decades. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, it's, it's another methodology. Um, I think from a requirement standpoint, it, it's kind of similar to how I, I would imagine you would have uh, agile work functioning. Um, it, it does help more to me, this is just me, um, from a maintenance and operation standpoint than from a development of a new system perspective. Um, you know, DevOps is really good, I think, at, at you know, uh, design, build, <clears throat> and uh, maintain uh, for existing systems, especially, you know, uh, systems that, that are more, um, have been around for a while. <clears throat> but... Yeah. Yeah, I can be wrong. Um, that's just my observation. Uh, next that question. Answered, answered your question. Yeah, uh, Benjamin, was that good? Yes, I see. Thank you, he says. <laughs> and then Tiger Lee says, if a waterfall development project adopted agile methodology in the user acceptance phase, would you like to call that, uh, would you like to call that way? Great talk, by the way, he says. Uh, and if that if that's not quite clear, it was a little unclear. To no, me. I understand what he's I, saying. I, I'm trying to think. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I was like, okay, what does he mean? Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe because I'm old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, um, waiting to to you know system or integration testing or acceptance, waiting for the end basically to find out that you missed something is probably not the best plan. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my book, um, I, I always like to catch things up front because, you know, from, from a development standpoint and from a maintenance standpoint, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to design things in rather than fix things after the fact, um, especially if um, integration uh, requires uh, uh, redevelopment of maybe a component or a recontract of a component, uh, which starts getting sticky because let's say you're, you're at, at that point where you've already made all your contractual arrangements with these subcontractors or, or vendors for their system, their code or, or interface to something else. And then later on you find out, oops, I got to redo it. Sometimes that might impact you on, on the contractual side as well, um, where uh, you know it might delay the project or it might cost you more money. Um, 
but but that's just my again my two cents on on that. So um, I have I have a, a, a logistics question. So will you we be able to get the slide deck so that we can share it with the the participants today? Sure. Yeah, Perfect. I'll send it to you right after this. Uh, hopefully, That's it's fine. not too big. It, um... No, no, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> you, you, well, you, can PD, you can PDF it for me, by the way. Okay, okay. And that's how that's how I would share it anyway. So PDF it for me. Okay, okay. I'll leave, I'll leave the, uh, the, but, I'll leave the I'd methodology like leave, slides like to, in. <laughs> perfect. Yes, please leave all them in because that, you know, you, you didn't have time to go over. If we had given him 90 minutes, like uh, <laughs> on a regular weekend, you'd have all of this information, but... Um, yeah, last, last year was too fast. Know. This year is a little too slow. <laughs> yeah, no, you're fine. We had a little extra time. But I do want to leave uh, the, the group with uh, one last question. Uh, and if you could give a brief answer, uh -huh. can you give uh, uh, one? So they're going to go in this afternoon around 1 15, 1 30 to meet mm -hmm. with the, the, the project man, the, the challenge sponsors. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you give us like one or two questions that you think are the, or an example of a type of question that you think is more productive and uh, how to gather requirements? Uh, that would be helpful, I think, to the team here today. Um, I, maybe the first uh, two questions would be, um, what is your overall objective of the solution? And, and if they could describe it what they okay. see. So if you, if you notice on that first slide where they, the three, the three seats, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, having yeah. to describe it and, and you documenting and, and maybe active listening and asking questions like, Hey, why is there a middle seat? <laughs> why are there three instead of, you know, one seat, you know, things like that. Um, in that interaction as they're describing, just wait, let them describe it first and then think through what they just said and then start asking, questions to engage in clarity in what they're describing. Um, because a lot of times, uh, just um, be careful with terminology as well. What I noticed um, a lot of times is um, exiting discussions, we leave the meeting thinking that we all understand <laughs> what was being said. Uh, only to find out that because people have preconceived ideas on uh, language, on experiences and whatnot, a lot of times we leave with totally different understanding of what's being said. And, and so um, a lot of times uh, going back and uh, getting clarity, uh, maybe you know, documenting it or taking notes and, and going over it again and uh, going back to whoever you talk to and said, hey, is this exactly what you, you're talking about? Uh, we'll, we'll help with that loop and that engagement um, to make sure that you understand what they're asking for. In some cases they'll go, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant this, you know? Yep, perfect. Okay, so uh, does anybody else have any questions for Joel? This is your chance to maybe practice a good question. <laughs> I'll give us you a two seconds here. You snooze, you lose type of stuff. So, uh, okay, I'm not hearing anything and no one's bringing up their cameras. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Joel, I mean, for your good discussion. Thank you. Um, and we uh, appreciate you uh, a lot. Um, and I'll be seeing you uh, down the road. Um, and of course, uh, feel free to reach out to us. And are you on Slack? Are you going to be on our Slack channel? Um, you know, something happened to my connection to Slack. Uh, I'm not sure if our security guys kind of cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, well, I, tr um, I tried connecting, but, uh, you know, I, I can certainly try again. I, I'll talk to you about that offline. Yeah, let's talk about that offline because okay. uh, I want to say if you have questions on, on um, Joel's presentation, reach out to him on Slack, but I guess I can't say that yet. So reach well, you out can, to and uh, we'll, we'll figure out the connection. We'll, and we'll figure it out. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he's not quite there. He was there and now he's not there anymore. So once he gets back on, if you have any questions for him, please reach out to him. Yeah, thank you. And, and I apologize for the color. Something goofy is going on with my, my background and, and the clouds and everything. And so my, my color is turning off. I'm from red to purple to... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you, you turned your camera off, so your slides were well focused on your I slide. worked on that all morning, see, like this. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, this knowledge goes beyond hack, and I know how this is important. This skill is important for me, for my day-to-day -day work. Finally, we'll be hearing from George Lee, the Hack Technical Manager. He'll be providing an overview of the tools you'll need to use to participate and share your solution with the Technical Review Committee on October 31st. So without further ado, here's George. Hi, George. Before you, before you get started, um, just be aware, I already have a question was added on Slack for you. So not, let me forget to ask you. Uh, I told him to ask uh, him, already, so maybe I'll beat I him on that. <laughs> but uh, I, I already replied. But yeah, uh, that's great. But still, I'd like you also to answer it for the general populace so they know. Because uh, I'm sure. Well, yeah, come I, up I, with I, yeah, I, I plan on giving a demo anyway, so um, that yeah. will be covered. As part okay, of that. and uh, take it away. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Uh, Let's see, where is sharing? Because I haven't used Zoom in a while. Uh, green, there's a little green button at the bottom that says share. Oh, there screen. it is. That's it. Okay, I got it. All righty, we'll move things around here. Let me get this out. Okay, uh, and then slideshow. Uh, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so this is our last uh, official talk of the uh, morning slash afternoon uh, before you all start talking to the um, challenge sponsors. Um, and we're just going to go over um, some of the technical tools for Hack, um, just noting that um, some of these have already been covered a little bit. Um, we've talked about, um, I mean, the y'all have probably seen Hack Hui. Um, y'all are on the Slack. Um, and we'll be we'll also be covering um, you know, when you're actually developing your solutions, um, using GitHub as your code repository, um, as well as um when you actually create your submission, um, using uh dev post to create the submission. So yeah, so uh, what this presentation will be um, covering, as I said, um, Slack, GitHub, and uh, DevPost. And I do want to point out that a lot of these are covered on the Hack website, um, uh, hack.hawaii.gov slash tools. Uh, there, um, let me click on it real fast. Um, here's a, I mean, a lot of different resources, um, link to the Slack, um, Note about GitHub, um, some tutorials if you're new to GitHub. Um, it's a great um, place to learn about it. Um, some help on dev post, uh, past recordings, um, and some you know video links at the bottom as well. All right. Um, so let's quickly touch on Slack again. Um, I think most of, not all of you are on Slack. If you're not, then um, please uh, join us. Um, so Slack is going to be the communication platform for all things hack related. Um, through Slack, uh, you can communicate with each other. You can communicate with your teammates. Uh, you can communicate with us. You can communicate with me. Uh, if you have technical questions, communicate with, you can ask Toma questions. If um, there's an issue um, signing up, um, as far also for the challenge sponsors, um, hopefully um, all of them will be on Slack um, to answer questions. It's a great opportunity. Uh, if you're performing that you know, agile methodology and um, kind of have something to present for um, for the challenge sponsors, um, it's a great opportunity to kind of reach out through Slack um, to do that. Um, also, um, a lot of our um, announcements and such will happen uh, through Slack rather than email. Uh, so please do sign up for Slack if you haven't already. Uh, as far as guidelines go, um, please follow code of conduct. Uh, this uh, is part of the hack rules. Um, there's a link uh, to that. 
Um, to keep kind of the noise down a little bit, um, please do ask questions for specific challenges in respective challenge channels. Um, also, um, I realize that a lot of people are, a lot of you all are probably students, um, but um, don't always expect answers immediately. Um, I, I mean, the hack is put on largely by a volunteer cohort. Um, and of course we do have full-time jobs. We'll try to answer um, in a timely manner, um, but um, just um, please be patient with us um, as we'll you know, try to get to your answers um, as soon as we can. All right, uh, GitHub, um, I think uh, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with GitHub. We had a um, pre-hack um, pre workshop um, on GitHub. Um, and of course, Microsoft, who owns GitHub, is a big sponsor. Um, but uh, we've always used GitHub um, in however many, seven years of the hack to um, manage the source code. Um, and what this means is that um, as you're developing your solution for each uh, competition, if you're using, um, if you're writing code, um, we um, will create uh, repositories for you. Um, and it'll be a place for you to uh, host your code. And it's also a place um, for you to collaborate with your teammates. So um, instead of, I don't know how people did it without source code management, I guess you'd maybe email it to your friends or whatever, but, um, GitHub provides the essential place um, to um, collaborate with others. Uh, so yes, um, please do use um, GitHub and GitHub repositories. Um, also, uh, the code must be published here to be eligible for technical review. Obviously, um, we need your code to be able to have something to review. Um, also noting that the um, deadline or when technical review starts is um, Halloween. October 31st at 9 a.m. Um, also, all team members must have a GitHub account. Um, this is partly because um, team members who need to commit code, obviously they have to access the repository, which means they need to have a GitHub account. Um, and that's part of the hack we process. Uh, specifically for challenge sponsors, um, the other challenge sponsors are here. Um, you're not necessarily required to have a GitHub account. Um, I do, I put this slide in here mostly, um, if you do have, um, data, um, that you'd like to share, uh, that would like, I mean, you can upload it to Slack, but we can also add it to a central kind of GitHub repository for, um, data for sample data for all of the different, um, challenges. Um, so um, I could, if you do have an account and you're comfortable using GitHub, um, I could add you to that data repository. Um, if not, you can always um, send it to me in Slack or send it to, um, or just post it in Slack in general, um, and then we can, um, I can upload it to GitHub as well. Um, and yeah, and also, uh, if you want to share it in your uh, respective challenge channels, um, that'd be also very helpful. Uh, for, for participants, so once your team is decided, um, let me know and we'll um, create a GitHub repository. Um, it's going to be under this organization called github.com slash hack 2022. Um, the application code must be hosted on GitHub with the appropriate open source license. Uh, Tom has kind of talked about that already, that you must have a open source, your code must be open source for the duration of the um, hackathon. Um, and typically the license you'll select is MIT, but um, if you have specific licenses in mind, um, there's uh, many to choose from. Um, having any secret or proprietary code may disqualify you from the competition. So um, like say for example, you're um, solving a challenge and um, you have like a front end, which is um, all like on GitHub and posted, but your back end code um, leverages like, um, I don't know, internal to your own, you know, company or even just among friends or um, et cetera. Um, having that um, 
not be publicly available for us to review uh, in a technical review. Uh, that may disqualify you from the competition. Um, for technical review, we'll also want to have a publicly available, um, I guess a public deployment of your application. Uh, so your application running on a web server somewhere. Um, we have a lot of resources um, as um, you may have seen in pre hack workshops, um, there's hosting platforms such as um, Azure, um, Google Cloud. Um, and I know we have um, a bunch of those um, sponsors in uh, different channels in the Slack. So if you do need help um, with those platforms, um, that's a um, good place to look. Um, and finally, if you do have issues with your repository, um, you need to add people or um, whichever, um, do just, let me know on Slack. Um, I do get requests quite often for either um, changing permissions or different applications need to be added. Um, so um, which is fine. Um, so just um, ping me, I'll probably get some emails too and maybe reach out if um, you know, I see something come my way that needs approval. Uh, finally, DevPost. Um, so DevPost is a platform for hosting hackathons. Uh, we've been using uh, DevPost for a while. Um, so the kind of neat thing about DevPost is that um, is we're just one hackathon among, I don't know, probably thousands, tens of thousands hackathons, um, past and present in uh, DevPost. Um, so it kind of tracks kind of like all the company, like if, once you sign up for a DevPost account, it kind of tracks your um, participation in all these different uh, hackathons. And um, there's also a little bit of gamification in there for um, like, you know, winning hackathons or like participating in a bunch, et cetera. Um, it also, um, for your um, hackathon submissions does um, provide a nice kind of front end um, page um, where uh, people can come to view the information. So you can view the description, you know, link to your uh, GitHub repository. Um, this is where your functional um, acceptance, your functional video uh, will also be uploaded. Um, so that will also be viewable on this page. And the technical review team will um, be using your dev post page to um kind of as part of the technical review process um so all teams um must have a dev post submission under the hack 2022 hackathon um and that's the url i'll kind of walk through it um in a bit as well um and you must have this submission by um the start of the technical review time which is again um halloween 10 31 at 9 a.m uh, finally, I do highly recommend all team members have a DevPost account, um, so submissions can be attributed to them. Um, just that um, your um, name and such is shown as part of the um, hackathon team, I and mean, especially if you win, um, that is um, something that you can kind of show off, but even if you don't, um, and uh, future employers might be looking at outside projects that you've done, um, having a your DevPost account and having it list all of the hackathons that you've been to, or even just this hackathon, um, is definitely um, it's definitely worthwhile. I think. Uh, so DevPost submissions, um, again, I'll give a demo in a bit. Um, but what's required, um, we'll need a link to the GitHub repository. Um, this is mostly for um, just kind of linking between the two, because oftentimes team names change and the team and the project are different. Um, this kind of avoids a little bit of that confusion. Uh, link to the publicly available solutions. So if you have, yeah, if you have a website, um, a link um, to that um, so that technical review can kind of um, go there and test it out. Uh, the video, the functional video, uh, demoing your solution and all the different uh, functionality to it. Um, and also we have a security question. Um, the security question is about uh, how would you secure your um, application? Um, the answer to that is required before your um, submission is accepted. 
Um, many of you, when developing your solution, uh, will probably have some sort of admin dashboard or maybe some logged in view for um, users when they're um, viewing content on your um, applications. Um, so those login requirements, um, you probably don't want, I mean, you definitely don't want them um, publicly available. So I um, please don't uh, post them on DevPost, don't have them on GitHub. Um, they should be uh, messaged uh, directly to me. Um, and um, once technical review time comes around, we can, or I can um, hand out those um, credentials to the your technical judges. Um, also, um, DevPost, you can post a lot of other things on DevPost, just other information um, you can talk about. Um, each individual can talk about their contribution, you can talk about the, your experience in the hackathon, what other challenges you had to overcome. All that stuff, the kind of description is kind of optional, um, but is definitely highly recommended. Um, and again, if you're presenting this to your um, future potential employers, then um, yeah, the more detailed, the more presentable your dev post, post is, the better. And again, the um, this submission is due um, when that review starts. Uh, let me skip past that, Oops. that slide. Um, so finally, there's other tools um, that we haven't directly covered. Um, so any other tools are pretty much up to you. Um, we're not going to um, police whatever, like however you wanna do your deployments or um, however you wanna collaborate. Um, of course, like I said, Slack is gonna be a central, comp central place of discussion for um the hackathon um, at large so when you're communicating with me or you're communicating with Thelma or you're communicating with challenge sponsors that all can happen on slack um but if you and your friends um like to play games and you all are on your own discord or um other tools um perfectly fine again we're not we're not policing your usage of other tools just please um do have a slack account so you are kept up to date on um, everything that's going on in the hackathon. Um, other tools, as far as like deployment, like technical tools, or um, there's, um, well, for deployments or for like hosting your web application, there's uh, Heroku, I think the newer ones, are like fly.io, and um, there's a couple of others. Um, lots of data storage solutions, like MongoDB might be one. Um, uh, plant scale is kind of a big startup um, that's um, hosts database as well. Um, you might be using Salesforce to do uh, low code, no code solutions. And of course, um, all the different tools from the hackathon sponsors. Um, Microsoft has Azure. Um, of course, they have um, GitHub um, and VS Code. Um, the GitHub student pack that might have been covered uh, before, but um, that includes um, deployments to our some credits for DigitalOcean, um, another kind of um, hosting platform. Um, so um, yeah, all this to say is um, outside of um, having to use Slack, having to use putting your code on GitHub and um, having to post a dev post submission by um, technical review time. Other than that, um, everything's fair game. Um, as long as you um, follow the follow the rules and all that other stuff. Um, so yeah, and so please uh, do feel free to try something new. I um, I, um, I personally was a uh, uh, participant in the very first hack. Um, I took I used to do hackathons. I don't do many hackathons anymore, but I did a lot of hackathons um, as an opportunity to. Um, try out new things, things, you know, take me, take myself out of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, um, they even say maybe bolster the resume a little bit. Um, so I highly recommend, um, yeah, just, um, stretching yourself a little bit. Um, and, um, yeah, just try something new and, you know, if, if anything, it, it will look, it will look great in the resume. Um, yeah, so as promised, let's do a quick demo.
Um, so for this demo, um, I'm going to use uh, a tool called Vercel. So Vercel um, lets you deploy uh, kind of front-end projects uh, really quickly. You have kind of nice integrations with um, GitHub and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to deploy a new project. So let's, um, I'm going to pick a Next.js template. Uh, Git repository must be created. So use GitHub. Uh, it's hack 2022. So yeah, I'm going to say uh, hack uh, web demo. Um, it's not private, so it's public. Um, so this is going to go for a bit. Um, so it's going to clone into there and start building. Um, let's wait for that a little bit. Um, so George, George, what what program was this again? This is Vercel. Um, this is just one of again one of your one of your options. It's an for, example. Um, I know. I understand that. I just uh, yeah. Um. So. Like, Maybe put here. the link in chat so people can check it out. Sure. Okay, so um, we created my repository. Um, this is probably going to be a little bit different for you all because um, you already have a repository, but I know what it looks like. Um, so this is my project. Um, it's deploying, it already deployed. Um, awesome. <laughs> Take the dashboard. Um, so it's deployment. Um, so you notice domain, um, which is kind of cool. So we're still automatically deploys to um, the remote domain. Um, so with that, I can click on this. I have an app. Hack web demo that sell that app. Uh, so uh, I feel like sorry, it's like hiding behind the zoom toolbar. It's very difficult. Uh, so okay. Um, so this is uh, hack twenty twenty two that dev post com. Again, you know, we'll be going here to um get your submissions. Um, I already started one, but let's see if I'm going to create another one. It's easier. Oh, man, I have to do this while everybody's watching. <laughs> yeah. That's not a even bicycle. a bicycle. That's, that's not, not a, bicycle. a bicycle. I know. Oh, maybe it's a fat wheel bicycle. I think that's what uh, it is. You include the mirror? I guess so. Yeah, why not? Oh, you missed one. There you go. <laughs> Traffic lights. Man. Okay, uh, manage team. Um, so there was a uh, question earlier about um, how to set up again, um, or how to set up your DevPost account. Again, I highly recommend that everybody have their own uh, DevPost account. Um, the person creating the project will be the quote unquote manager or the creator. Um, therefore, they're the only ones that can um, remove um, people um, from the from the project. Um, so um, can invite teammates. Um, I don't have anybody else. I think I'm writing this solo. So I will save and continue. But of course, if you do have other people, you can send them this link or something. Uh, save and continue. Project overview. Um, Burgers, demo, app, uh, elevator pitch. Um, this is the best app, really hard on it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, about the project, um, again, I have to put some information in here. So, um, inspired by having to give a technical hack. 
um, and you have options to come up with other things too. Uh, built with Next.js, uh, Vercel, et cetera. Uh, try it out links. Um, so these are optional on the first part of the um, submission process, but you actually have to put in, um, you'll be required later on to provide links. So I'm going to skip this for now. Uh, video demo link. Uh, right here. Oops. Okay, uh, additional info. Um, so this is where um, you'll have to answer some of our additional questions. Uh, this is a security question. So how should your function be secured? Um, we have a little uh, help text uh, along there. Um, this app is publicly available. So it doesn't need to be screwed. <laughs> um, of course, your solutions will have, and I, there's a 300 character, word character limit. I don't remember. Um, no, word. I hope um, it's word, not character. <laughs> word. Okay. 300 word, 300 word limit. Um, so um, please do provide more detail. Um, I'm doing this for the purpose of the demo and um, trying to get through this. Um, so we have time for questions. So uh, GitHub repository. So there's a question here, George, you, pro you provide the GitHub repositories, correct? Yes. So George provides the GitHub repository uh, repos. Uh, and when do you do you, when do you start providing those to people? Um, do I have to wait? Um, don't have to wait. Um, if you do have a team um, already set up, um, I believe we can look at Hackway and start setting up those teams too. Um, that's how we've done it in the past. Um, but and you have no, access, you don't. Right? Uh, I'll have to check. Okay. It's been a while. Um, but um, no, you do not have to. You do not have to wait. Um, well, hopefully, um, I'm sure a lot of these requests will start coming over the over the weekend. So we'll hopefully um, get to them um, in a timely manner. Um, and then finally, the URL from the code submission that's here. That's this one that I posted here. Right. Okay, um, so file stages submit. Um, there is a final reminder um, just to make sure um, you understand um, all the requirements. So the first thing is your GitHub repository is up to date with the latest version um, in advance of the tech evaluation. Um, team electing to create um, you know, a solution using code um, to make sure their code is deployed, public location, um, and you have to provide that URL. Um, Yep, and steps to how, steps on how to access, how to log in should be included in your um, uh, description. But again, like the actual credentials uh, should just be messaged to me. Um, finally, uh, if you're using a low no-code uh, platform based solution, uh, please do provide a. Um, I mean, obviously, we need access to the application again, um, as well as um, it's kind of a written summary of the different modules that you used. All right, and then so, finally note that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanna say, um, the, if, they, if they're doing, uh, the question that I have is if they're doing no code, low code, how do they deal with the, having a, not having a GitHub repository? They won't need one for that, will they? Yeah, that's true. Uh, we could, um, I, can't, I can't like conditionally have it. Um, I feel like the easiest thing to do is um, either you know, put a readme at least inside of your GitHub repository okay, about it. That's a good um, idea. That's a good place. That's a good um, idea. To, to, just have, to just have something in there. Um, yeah. um, then I see a question, is all done? Is all done after we completed our project prior to 10, do you want me to fill out before we start the run? Right, of course. Uh, we, um, there's only, um, you do need to fill this out and you do need to submit this in advance of the technical review. 
um, on 1031. Uh, that doesn't, um, you don't need to, and you probably even shouldn't fill it out today just because you don't know. I mean, obviously you don't have GitHub repositories yet, um, but I mean, and you probably don't know how you want to secure your solution, unless maybe you do. Um, so yeah, I, these um, need to be completed in advance of the, tech, of the technical review. Um, they don't need to be done today. Um, the dev post page, no. So, so um, as far as the as far as dev posts, um, you can sign up and create an account at any time. Um, so, um, this doesn't require um, any intervention on my part, um, except for one very small thing, but. As far as doing your submission, um, you, you don't need to um, you don't need to wait for anything from me to create your dev post page. And, and George will also have access to the Hack Hui. If he doesn't know, I'll make sure he has it before the end of the weekend. And he see he'll see um, uh, the teams, and he can start assigning uh, uh, GitHub repositories to them from there. Yes, great, um, great and I'm, yeah, I, I think in the past we've had issues with uh, people not providing GitHub usernames. Um, so um, I don't think that would be an issue, but um, we made it required it's more, it's more. moving forward. Good. So. Okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, so um, I'll um, once I get access back into Hackway, I will um, add teams from there. Um, if you do. Um, if you're actually waiting and you want to ping me with the GitHub usernames, um, I can take care of um, some of that as well. Um, just send it to me in Slack. Um, yeah. So finally, to close out this demo, I'll submit this project. Yes, my awesome video. Um, okay. And then that's pretty much it. So I think, so it does say the deadline is 1031 uh, or um, is Halloween. This is just to block it off at the time for um, technical review. I think you should still be able to add. You can't continue coding. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, dev post is just, um, and I, I apologize, I said, uh, add your credentials to dev post. I was wrong. Please listen to George, not me. Uh, and he's right. You shouldn't be making those public on Slack. So D, D, I mean, public uh, in your Git um, dev post account, make sure you, you DM them to him via Slack. Yep. Um, so for the other team members, this is like, as you can describe your contribution. Um, this, um, Again, like for other people, um, I, you know, as far as like having something on your resume, I recommend uh, you put something here. Um, describe a contribution, um, and I did everything. Okay, um, and then hack. Yeah, the, you can still be a participant in the Hack uh, Hackathon. You just have to have uh, signed up to the Hack Hui and joined a team by 5 p.m. on Tuesday the 18th. And that'll give me a segue into saying that we have um, close to 90 participants that do not have a team yet. So uh, make sure you get on about putting your teams together or joining a team, whichever way it is. And because we opened the Hack Hui early, we did not make the challenges required. But if you don't pick a challenge by 5 p.m. on um, your, and just do it once, pick the one you're actually working on uh, by 5 p.m. on the same date, the 18th, uh, we're going to consider you uh, not uh, participants. We need you to pick that so the tech review judges know what to do with your your uh, part, um, your solution, okay? Thank you. Sorry, George, didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no, I think that's all I got. Um, so yeah, the last thing was just any questions. I'm already seeing some questions kind of filter in, but I don't know if there's uh, anything else. Um, 
George and I will be at an Ask Me Anything session on the 29th, uh, half an hour to 60 minutes, uh, depending on what you guys need. Um, so if you start, and, and as he emphasized, and I'll emphasize again, uh, he and I are really good Slack users. We will uh, respond. We're not necessarily instantaneous. Uh, I'm in California, so if you if you if you Slack me at six o'clock at night, I'm probably sound asleep in bed by then. Well, maybe not that early, but I'm probably not looking at my computer anymore. So you'll get an answer in the morning. And George, you know, works and stuff. So uh, we we will answer as quickly as we can, and we're very both very good at that. So don't 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 sweat it. Okay. Can we use multiple, namely two GitHub repositories for our submissions, George? Oh, it kind of complicates things a little bit, I guess. Um, so, like, so I guess the question is, do you need me to set up two repositories? I, I think I can do that and then you can just kind of um, maybe highlight the two different repositories, like it's part of your dev post. We only left space for one repository, but if you do have, if you do need me to create multiple, do you need me to create multiple, you'll have to probably um, let me know. Um, but I feel like um, I don't recommend it, but. Um, Thank you, George. I was gonna say that because it's gonna make it really hard for the, the if, if you, have two repositories and the judges can't find the right one, then you're going to get a low score. So don't make it more complicated than it needs to. Yes, um, I will um, freely admit after doing these technical reviews for a couple of times now that um, even after a technical review period, we're always chasing people down for different things. So. Um, please like um, make it as easy for us as possible. That said, if you, um, I mean, we can, we, yeah, please don't, but I mean, if you have a really good reason, uh, we, we can talk about it. All right, well, let's, if you don't mind wrapping this up, George, because we got to move on to the, yep. we, we, we stole back all our spare time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I would talk that me. much, but so, I, I am so uh, thank you, George, very much for um, giving this presentation. And uh, I, I have to say, I really have appreciated working with you these last seven, well, not maybe seven years, uh, but thank you for uh, always helping me get the technical side done properly. So, and back to, back to Leo. All right. Thanks, George. Uh, thank you for that uh, important information. If you have questions about anything you learned today, remember to use the Hack 2022 Slack workspace. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to be transitioning to the Slack, uh, to the challenge sponsor breakout rooms. But before we do that, we have one more contest. Um, again, the same thing, the 7th, 17th, and 27th person who enters in the chat will win a $25 gift card uh, to Starbucks. Um, so... Please enter your answers after Janet has entered go in the chat room. And the question for this last contest is going to be, are you more productive in the morning or at night? <clears throat> <laughs> that was a fast one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think for me, it's just after I have my coffee. <laughs> I'm more, I'm a morning person. Morning. <laughs> well, maybe like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, <laughs> not seven o'clock. Yeah. For me, I, I just got to have my coffee. Then I'll be, I'll be good after that. I've been, I've been having to have meetings at, you know, seven o'clock, which is not so bad, but I had, a, <laughs> I'll share with everybody. I had a meeting once it was at three o'clock in the morning when I was working in Maui and I had an East coast meeting at 9.00 AM. <laughs> It was oh, not fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I think this past week I had classes started four in the morning. <laughs> the past five days, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. turning, turning it over to Sheila so she can do her breakout room discussions. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Leo, finish your last comment there. You don't need to hijack the, schedule, the script. <laughs> All right. 
um i guess that's pretty much it again remember guys um please stay uh to the end um so that when the winners are announced you guys need to be uh present for that uh for those uh gift cards as far as for the break breakout rooms i guess i'll turn it over to sheila as uh, she'll have instructions for you guys awesome well, aloha and welcome to the last phase of today's kickoff presentation and all of the information that you guys have acquired. Um, so the next about 50, 55 minutes, there's going to be a chance for you to start those requirement gathering pieces that so will allow you to better understand the goals and the objectives of your challenge sponsors and the challenges themselves. So as you'll see, we're going to be opening up the breakout rooms in just about a minute or so. You'll get to choose and roam freely. Okay, the rooms are being named according to the challenges. And so please be aware of which one you're going into. Um, you will be able to leave the breakout rooms and go back into another breakout room. Just do it with your button, which says leave the breakout rooms. Um, this is where you can join in, you can listen, and you can ask questions of the challenge sponsors. So if, but if you are having any problems, please stay in the main room, which is this one, and ask if for some reason you're unable to either see your breakout room button and or be able to get into a breakout room, we may be able to find you a way to be assigned in there or try to figure out how we can get you in there. We do have about 50, 55 minutes. We're going to be ending the breakout rooms about 2.25. Okay, so we can wrap up and talk story about who won the prizes. Okay. Any uh, insight that you want to give Thelma or Leo before we open up the breakout rooms? All right. Yeah, so let's ju just um, make sure you, uh, if you're not decided yet, if you've decided which challenge you really are passionate about, try to spend most of your time there. But if you're, if you're still kind of trying to figure it out, wander around. I also want to ask that when you're in the rooms where, uh, with the challenge sponsors, uh, feel free to um, see who's interested in that challenge and maybe uh, connect to them directly if you don't have a team yet or you're trying to form a team. So this is a, uh, and, and uh, we won't rush out at 2.30 on the nose and go, bye everybody, here's the prizes, goodbye. We'll, we'll hang out for a minute. So if you want to spend a little time chatting with each other, uh, plan to do that. And then uh, I also created a channel on um, this Slack called uh, looking, looking for Teammates. So go in there and start talking. Um, share some of your expertise or that I'm not very experienced, but I want to join a team but that's doing this challenge because I think that's really cool and I want to help any way I can and just participate and learn. And I hope that the teammate, the team leaders and the other teammates will be open and welcoming. That's what you should be. So, uh, and I do want to reiterate that um, no direct messages to the challenge sponsors. If you have a question for them, it must be in the challenge sponsors channel and have at it everybody go for it Sheila all right so here goes you guys go ahead and join in and listen up have a blast see you in a little <laughs> 